Continue. Okay, everyone, we are live now. And I will quickly post in the chat information for our audience. One second. So welcome everyone to this, uh, this book session. We'll hear about two interesting books today. And these are the two books, The Cities of Dignity and Towards a Political Economy of Degrowth. And with us today, there are three contributing authors of each book. So we will start today with discussing The Cities of Dignity. And afterwards, we will turn to the book Towards a Political Economy of Degrowth. Um, and then we will have about 20 minutes to half an hour um, in order to discuss some of your questions. So if you have any questions during the presentation of either of these books, um, to either one of the specific authors or to the book in general, you can just um, post the question in the chat and please mark them as question with the red queue so that I can pick them up. And I'm really sorry if we can't respond to all the questions due to limited time. However, um, after the discussion, you will have the possibility to go to Discord and there you can discuss with some of the authors who will be there and amongst yourselves as well. So with us today for the Cities of Dignity are Mabruka Mbarek and Isaac Asume Osuka. And I'll briefly present both of them to you. Um, originally, Georges Villegakis was supposed to be with us today as well, but sadly he couldn't join. Um, so we'll improvise a little bit, but you will still get all the important information about this really nice book. So Mabruka Mbarek was an elected member of the Tunisian National Council of the Sorry, she was a member of the Tunisian National Constituent Assembly from 2011 to 2014. And her efforts focused on including provisions of food, of resources and economic sovereignty in Tunisia's new constitution, which she helped draft. And I see that uh, you just, just joined us today as well. So he'll also take part in this um, discussion. I'm happy to, um, that it worked out. Because Georgis Velegrakis, he's an adjunct faculty member at the Philosophy and History of Science Department at the National and Cappadocian University of Athens. So he's researching and teaching um, on issues related to, um, to political ecology, radical geography, socio-environmental conflicts and movements, and the science technology society interrelations. And then we have Isaac Afume Osuka, who is the director of the Social Action, which is a Nigerian organization working for social justice through research, popular education, and advocacy in solidarity with communities, activists, and scholars. And now I'm handing the floor to um, Georges. Please, Georges, you can start. Hello. Uh, you can hear me, right? We can hear you very well, thank you. Thank you, sorry for uh, this small delay. Uh, okay, as you said, I'm Yorgos. I'm very happy to be with you, uh, with Mabruka, Asume, and also Lele and Stefania, that we have a, a history back from the entitled project. I'm very happy that we are all together here. So, I will be, <clears throat> I will start right away uh, by talking a bit about uh, the global working group that is, has created this book and uh, a bit like a, a quick overview of the book. So uh, this book is the third publication of our global working group Beyond Development. <clears throat> this is a group that seeks to analyze and critique the global political economy and its social, political and environmental impact. 
taking as its premise the diagnostic that the world is facing a civilization crisis, a crisis caused by the notions of unlimited growth guiding our societies and the resulting dispossession at the margins principally affecting the global south. The group includes around 30 engaged researchers, movement-based organizers, activists, and popular educators from all five continents. It is a collective space for us where people from different disciplines or schools of thought can converge and dialogue as ecologists, Marxists, the colonial thinkers, feminists, and others. The working group for us constitutes a space for learning, unlearning, and interacting regarding the possible introduction of radical emancipatory transformations in opposition to the capitalist, colonial, racist, patriarchal status quo responsible for the ongoing social and ecological destruction of our planet. For our group, seeking alternatives beyond development means seeking alternatives beyond this very civilization that capitalist modernity has saved beyond this civilization so keenly focused on economic growth, on instrumental and destructive societal relations with nature, and on a rational, profit-maximizing and individualistic understanding of humanity that had led us, according to our opinion, into this crisis. It also means giving space to other forms of understanding dignity beyond the language of human rights, which was shaped in a very specific context after World War II and represents only one of the possible languages of dignity from which the majority of the world's population is excluded in practice. So why this book? Why to focus on urban space? Why cities of dignity? Realizing that many of the working group's conversations tended to revolve around rural areas, areas participants started thinking about transform transformations in urban spaces. How might they be different and how do they relate to rural spaces? Urban radical transformations seemed more complex and challenging. <clears throat> so in order to focus on the, other, on the urban context, we came up with uh, our initial central collective research questions that are, first, what conditions and strategies enable radical transformation in urban contexts? Second, what kind of economic and political processes can sustain urban radical transformations? Third, what urban realities does the countryside need to redignify rural life and rural urban relations and vice versa? And finally, what theoretical and political frameworks are useful for establishing urban radical transformations? In the various case studies that make up this book, the most important factors are the status of social relationships and the balance of social, class, and political forces that define the relationship of the society in question with its urban environments. This is because we conceptualize the various urban co contexts as a social relation, not a given solid thing or a commodity, despite global capital, despite global capital's attempt to bring about the opposite effect. <clears throat> That is the reason why we talk about territories as opposed to environments. The notion of territory relates to the significance of the space, taking into account the relations between people and the environment, geography, as well as culture and history. One second, Therefore, could you read a little bit slow, or could you present a little bit slower, please, for our mm. audience? to um, be able to digest them in interesting information. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really sorry. I was, uh, I was afraid about the time framework. Really, really sorry. Don't uh, worry. Bit, we will manage. More. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Okay. So I was trying to give a, a very general example of uh, a general overview of how we came up with this idea of this book. Uh, so, continuing this framework, uh, I'm saying that uh, we understood that cities all over the world have experienced multiple forms of popular discontent 
as well as localized social environment movements. In some instances, these movements have taken the form of political communities focused not only on addressing current specific needs, but also on transforming their urban environment. To this end, they try, and in, make it, and in many cases successfully, to build strong, lasting processes of participation, democratization, and decision-making, whereby internal power relations are collectively identified, identified and tackled, and ongoing experimentation and knowledge acquisition and production are based on old and new forms of democracy. Furthermore, they introduce more equitable social relations, transform discriminatory or even racist inter-ethnic and intercultural relations, the base of knowledge and experience deemed necessary to advance social processes and dismantle patriarchal uh, gender relations. So that was a kind of a, of a big overview, theoretical overview. So finally, I will spend two more minutes to give you an overview of all the chapters that we have in this book. Uh, this book includes some case studies as well as uh, its collective discussion on the possibilities and challenges for radical urban transformation while paying tribute throughout to the tremendous transformative potential of cities. It consists of nine chapters besides the introduction and the collective reflections. So uh, in the first chapter, uh, Mauro Castro and Mark Marti Costa uh, from Spain set out the theoretical basis for the notion of urban commons, a very familiar notion. And they combine two approaches, the liberal approach and the autonomist Marxist approach. In the second chapter, Mary Ann Manhannan and Maria Christine Alvarez present a survey of existing transnational initiatives and how they can support urban transformations. Such as, I give just two examples, the transformative city atlas of utopias and the fearless cities and many others. The third chapter reports on the efforts made by popular movements to dismantle patriarchy and transform urban ter territories uh, threatened by state violence and expropriation, I'm sorry, in Brazil, as described by Isabella Gonçalves Miranda, who is a long-standing organizer who recently won a council seat in the municipal elections in Belo Horizonte in Brazil. The fourth chapter, uh, we have Ana Rodriguez and Patrick Holstein, that describe the struggle organized by the San Roque market against the municipality of Quito in Ecuador. And this chapter makes a key contribution to describing the social role played by popular markets, which are not limited to the marketing and distribution of commodified food. The fifth chapter is an original contribution by Mabr Mabruka Mubarak, who is with us from Tunisia and Delandria Williams from the United States who travel together to meet cooperative incubators, enablers, organizers, and political activists in the black communities of Birmingham, Alabama, in Alabama, Jackson in Mississippi, and Detroit, Michigan in the U.S. <clears throat> Following this learning journey, the authors offer insights into questions of race, land struggles, and what it means to belong to a community in the U.S. In the sixth chapter, Marion Covet, drawing on inputs from Ruth uh, Mawangi, uh, who is participating in the working group, <clears throat> describes the trial in Kenya of a community controlled currency known as the Eco Pesa and the credit tool called the Sarafu Credit. The growing number of women taking part in these processes show how community controlled and owned currency and credit tools can reduce the marginalization of women. Another case study from Africa related in the, in this, in the seventh chapter is the organized resistance of slum dwellers in Makoko, in the Nigerian capital of Lagos. Asume, who is with us, and uh, Abiodun Aremu described how Makoko 
a fishing community predating the establishment of Lagos by the British colonists, became a magnet for migration, attracting indigenous people dispossessed by the colonists or fleeing slavery. Two more minutes, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, eighth chapter is we have Ansar Yassim that provides an account of the 15th Garden Movement pushing for food sovereignty in Syria. And uh, her article explicitly repudiates the need for geopolitical positioning or for a description of the various debates surrounding that country, which in her opinion, not only ignore the existing grassroots movement, but also ignore Syrian voices. And finally, we have the last case study presented by Asim Isra and Sandeep Birmani in the uh, ninth chapter, who relates the steps the slum dealers of Bu in uh, uh, India took to assert their rights and to come up with their own city planning. When employees of development NGOs realized that the work they were doing in rural areas could be applied to their own urban territories, they drew on their experience-based knowledge to benefit their own community. And finally, and uh, I sum up with this, the very last chapter, the very last chapter of the book is the result of the collective work carried out by all the members of the group, as most of the group's participants had analyzed and engaged in indeed in-depth discussions on the themes and topics addressed before. For us, it's very good. We are very proud of this final uh, um, a chapter because it is a, um, a work in progress aiming to conceptualize the historical times our world's urban spaces are currently experiencing and to explore the possibilities for, for multidimensional radical transformations. I hope I was fine with time, I'm not sure, but that's it from my point of view. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Georgios. Uh, now we'll talk about our own chapter in the book, Cities of Dignity, Urban Transformations Around the World, focusing on Makoko, the floating slum in the heart of Lagos. Lagos is Africa's largest city and the so-called commercial capital of Nigeria, and also the previous political capital of, of the country. Uh, our chapter is entitled, We Shall View what shall we build in Makoko? And it's about solidarity, struggles, and visions of social change in the slums of Lagos. Makoko is the most popular slum settlement in Lagos, the largest city in Africa, as I've said, as the biggest floating slum in the world. About a quarter of Makoko's buildings, including homes and workplaces, are built on stilts in the waters of the Lagos Lagoon. Makoko is referred to by some as the Venice of Africa. Uh, and we find that such romanticization has helped to attract considerable global media attention. And we see a rising number of Western camera wielding tourists coming to Magoko. Uh, right now, it is not possible to, to talk about the story of Lagos, a city with an estimated population of about 20 million people or more without talking about uh, Magoko. Now, however, the, the most of the pictures of Makoko mask the struggles of the about 20,000, 200,000 people that live in the Makoko that face constant hardship uh, and the struggle to find work in other parts of the Lagos mega city. So our chapter speaks to the, the reality of marginalization and disposition of the poor in urban planning. Part of the problem if we have to link it to the theme of this conference, is that the growth of a mega city exposes contradictions. In the first place, land is not unlimited. Secondly, the competition for land pitches the rich and the powerful against the poor. Thirdly, in a situation of finite land resources, there is the contradiction between the urban and the rural. Fundamentally, the story of Makoko shows the way that the demands of the economic growth in Europe from the 19th centuries and, 19th, and the 20th centuries shaped the way European corporations with the backing of Western European states shared Africa among themselves and created countries as entities of corporate rule, which is what colonialism is about. Global development in Nigeria from the beginning was part of the process of plunder of resources 
involving the evictions of indigenous communities to make way for the needs of corporations and the powerful. We find the story of Makoko that the character of the colonial state has not changed significantly even after independence and that the poor have to struggle to face to, for space and recognition against the state that continues to push them to the margins in, po in pursuit of economic growth. The dominant idea is that the rural is not compatible with the modern. That is the idea of development. And under this, this understanding, the rural and the poor are considered an embarrassment that must be hidden. While the urban centers depend on the food produced in rural areas and on the cheap labor from the, rural, from the poor, it does not want to cohabit with them. Makoko is then a story of radical transformation in practice. With its beauties and imperfections, it is a story of the rural and the poor standing up to the state, to the rich, and insisting on the right to share in the city space. Now, Mac Macoco was a fishing community that existed before the city of Lagos was, was created by British colonialists. Many of the indigenous coastal communities were sacked by the colonialists as, as they took over their lands to build the city of, of Lagos. Makoko was one of the about 50 villages that survived, you know, persisting side by side with the colonial settlement. However, the exclusion from the colonial city plan served to informalize them. From the 1960s, following Nigeria's independence from colonial, po colonial power, these waterside communities became a last refuge for some of the people who had moved to Lagos in search of opportunities, only to force impoverishment instead. Such communities expanded into the Lagos Lagoon as the city's population grew due to immigration from the rural areas. So what the people do is that they use their bare hands to dredge sand and mud from, the, from under the lagoon with buck, into buckets and reclaim land to build on. Later on, people started building houses on wooden stilts on the waters of the lagoon. That is, that is how it became a floating city within Lagos. Marco Coast residents use canoes uh, to get around. That is why uh, some, some of Western, you know, as have, uh, Westerners have referred to Makoko as, as the Venice of, 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 of Africa. The main occupation of residents of Makoko, the main occupation is, is fishing. Makoko's fishers work on the lagoon with their families. Their catches are sold to traders, often find women uh, living in the community at, at the traders. Fish is sold fresh or smoked. In, in, in open air markets, many of the boats used for fishing and local transport are built by community members themselves. The boats are also used for sand dredging uh, uh, and for building, for reclaiming land. Now, apart from the, the fishers, there are other residents of Makoko, including you know people that are even professionals, you know traders from from that uh, that ply their trade in the city. Among them are low-level civil servants and workers in factories and the services sector, such as banks, even, you know, security guards in the banks, you find them living in places like Makoko. Others are, you know, uh, all kinds of artisans, carpenters, mechanics in, in the city. Together, these people have established lifestyles in Makoko and built amenities without government intervention or government involvement at all. While its economy is tied to, this, to that of the city as a whole by trade and employment, Makoko enjoys self-government to some extent through a combination of a sense of mutual solidarity and the role of uh, traditional traditional leaders. Over the, the years, this community has remained neglected by the government in terms of provision of social services and infrastructure. Uh, Makoko has witnessed dramatic expansion from the 1990s, uh, particularly after the the forced eviction of people from other slum settlements in Lagos, in particular uh, the Morocco uh, community that was destroyed uh, in 1990, and the land given out to to the to the rich. Uh, we see that the way that the state has treated these communities provides insight into post 1980s neoliberalization of development in Nigeria. Beyond the precarity of housing for the urban poor we see in the plans of the military and civilian authorities running Lagos since the 1990s to the 2000s, a vision of a corporate-driven urban development, including the privatization of public water systems that is promoted by local capital and global capital, including 
through agencies such as the World Bank. In the 19, in the 1980s, so the social adjustment program did a serious damage to people's standard of living. And that has reflected in the, the precarity of, 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 of life uh, as reflected in what we see in, in Marco Kwa. There has been several attempts at evictions after following the, the 1990 uh, demolition of Morocco. Sometimes it's difficult to, you know, because, you know, they sound very uh, alike. There's Morocco, which was demolished in, in 1990. And then we are talking about this chapter, Marco Kwa, but drawing a lot from the example of Morocco. And we see that because of the experience of Morocco in 1990, uh, the people of Makoko, when the threat of demolitions came in 2012, were prepared uh, to, to, to prevent the, the, the evictions. Why the, the, the state succeeded in evicting a lot of people, demolished some of the, some of the, of the homes in the area, which they, which they can categorize as Ill illegal set settlements. Because of the struggles of, of members of the community, it was possible to halt those evictions. Uh, and, and so Mar 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 Coco is still st standing today because of the, of the struggles of, 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 the, of the people. Now, to because of time, uh, I just want to, to conclude that, that uh, Mar Coco and Morocco communities reflect the contradictions of colonial development and urbanity and expose the limitations of post-colonial citizenship. People belong to communities and as a political community in the form of states like Nigeria that has been created by colonial rule, uh, citizenship is presented as a form of validation of belonging to such, such, such entities. But when each city is denied the belongings of communities or fail to protect the rights of its members, then that citizenship is compromised. Sakoko presents a dynamic picture of the Nigerian masses and shows how they continue to subsist and thrive despite the exclusionist practices of the, of the economic and political elite. In that sense, Makoko is a community offering refuge to those who have come to call it home. When there is a threat of a vision, all the residents march together with a view to protecting their rights to housing. However, when there is a possibility of benefits or compensation from the government or NGOs, there is increased competition for ownership. Non-indigenous tend to focus more on their day-to-day -day jobs than the local politics. When dealing with communities like Makoko, NGOs have to navigate this delicate terrain, avoiding inadvertently taking the easy part of entrenching the participation of the local elite in the schemes of, of, of such plan, plans as the Makoko, Makoko Waterfront Regeneration Plan. And this is a plan, this plan, the, 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 the Waterfront Regeneration Plan is a collaboration uh, uh, between the community members and NGOs that work with them to try to resist the demolition attempts, to try to show that it is possible to have urban transformation that respects the rights of people to live, of the poor, to live with, within the, the city in communities like uh, Makoko. I will stop there because of time. And uh, I will hand over to... Uh, uh, my comrade, uh, Mabruka, who will provide additional reflection about all the cases covered by the book. Mabruka, as mentioned earlier, is one of the editors of the book. Uh, Mabruka's scholarship is grounded in her own experiences, including as an elected member of the Tunisian National Constitutional Assembly from 2011 to 2014. Her efforts focused on including proportions of food, resources, and economic sovereignty in Tunisia's new constitution, which she helps to draft. Mabruka, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Asume. Thank you, Yorgos. Thank you, Lina. Uh, thanks for having us uh, to present our book today, along with um, Stefania Barca's fantastic book. We're very honored to be here um, because we're launching the book this week. Uh, it's going to be available for free download this week, so we're excited. Um, I have 10 minutes, so I'm just going to talk about three things. The first thing I want to talk about is what is this book about, <laughs> um, like the big picture. Then I would like to share with you some of the um, some of the what we identify as kind of the main component of this book as a global working group. And the third uh, element I would like to share with you some strategies that we have identified because 
this conference is all about finding the strategies for emancipation, for self-determination, dignity. So how do we do that? So the first thing I wanted to say is this collective book written by people who are from movement-based experience, they're rooted in movement, they're organizers. It's not an academic book. This is a book rooted in material conditions and lived experiences. Um, I consider it as a political tool. Um, I think that a lot of people can draw a lot from it. Um, you know, we, a lot of people, they get tired of listening to, there's no alternative, there's no alternative. Well, here, this book is all about things that are already working, or maybe they're not working, things that are being tested. Um, because, you know, if we, um, we, if we stay defeatist, we're just going to beg for a new political party, fresh ideas, or even a global Green New Deal, and we're going to be having a lot of hope into it. What the Global Working Group Beyond Development is trying to do is to make visible some experiences that are already taking place. They're rooted in the past. They're, they've been there for many years. They're just used maybe sometimes a different language other than development. That's why we're called Beyond Development because a lot of these experiences use different languages of dignity, whether it's self-rule, Swaraj, as they say in India, or uh, self-determination of sovereignty, um, of dignity. So this is kind of the, the goal of this book. Again, I think it's because it's written mostly by non-academic, it will be useful for um, activists, movement organizers, people are trying to work on transforming um, their communities. The second um, part I would like to do is just to brush up very quickly what, as a global working group of 30 people coming from uh, different continents and different uh, epistemologies, when we sat together in 2018, sorry, in Barcelona, and we discussed all these case studies from Ecuador, the United States, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, Syria, India, Brazil, um, what did we identify some of the most important key things? The first thing I want to say is um, the group use a multidimensional social um, transformation framework. I mean, that sounds kind of gibberish, but what does it mean? It means that we're not looking at what we're looking when we see a transformation happening, things that are not just in opposition to one thing, one pattern of domination, but we're looking into what in that experience is geared toward anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism, to dismantle patriarchy, to decolonize, um, what is the action that are done for anti-racism, anti-casteism, um, but also transformation of our relation to nature to stop our predatory relation? We think that these uh, elements, anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism, decolonization, anti-racism, dismantling patriarchy, transforming our relation to nature, these are the key process for social change to restore dignity and enabling life. Um, like Yogo said, we wanted to focus on urban spaces because we felt whenever we talked about transformation, it was so easy for us to draw experience from rural spaces, perhaps because rural spaces have very strong concepts like uh, food sovereignty, for example, and they might be far from the center of capitalist power who are uh, based in the cities. Um, what we realize uh, is that you know, like Yogo said earlier, cities are not commodities. What does that mean? It means that cities are really element of social relationship. And as such, um, it's very in line with what uh, Carl Pogliani said, relationships can be reshaped and radically transformed. And this is what chapter four about the San Roque market um, is telling us about. The San Roque market in Ecuador is not just a place where we exchange goods. It's actually a, tr a place for social relationship where people who are transitioning from the rural space to Quito, they actually get mutual aid, solidarity from the market. And uh, the market also organized not just, like I said, for just a trade, but to organize for people to uh, improve their life. And so this is the San Roque market is so central 
um, into this uh, new relationship that is being um, established in Ecuador, in Quito, sorry. Uh, the other thing um, is that, therefore, what we do is not just um, when we look at these experiences, we're not just focusing on the macroeconomic and that's it. We're looking at the social conflicts um, because, um, you know, it is basically we're looking into the contradictions that are born out of capitalism and we see where, how the movements are responding to these contradictions. Like, uh, squeezing wage to increase profit and how the movements are responding. So we're looking at the social conflict to understand the situation. One of the things we realize in most of the case, urban commons have a central uh, place. And that's the reason why we start with the chapter that might be, is this is the most like theoretical chapter, but so important because we want to make sure that uh, people understand urban commons is not just a way to govern. It's not just the governance model, the way Elstrom um, uh, defined it. And then that to us, re it's really about idealism. We're really talking about the commons, the urban commons, not just the governance, but a way to reclaim the material conditions for life. And so it's really rooted into a materialistic perspective, historical materialistic perspective, and not an idealism of how to better govern together water or uh, this space. Or So it's, it's actually crucial. The political economy of urban commons is very central into this book. Um, you know, as you all know, cities have been the result of, um, of historical processes and mainly capitalism, but also imperialism. And, and here I want to talk about, from my perspective, a global self. And I just wanted to say the global working group is a mixture of people from global south and global north. So from my perspective, uh, when in the global north, capitalism reached that contradiction in squeezing everybody to get most of profit, one way was to, of course, colonize uh, the global south and extract resources uh, in the global south. And so in the global south, we feel that imperialism has reached, I mean, is really the way we, 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 um, we feel the pressure of capitalism. And therefore, you know, uh, the cities uh, in the global south have been uh, shaped to extract even more. Lagos is a particularly uh, flagrant um, example. Um, and in fact, uh, the way the cities have been built with the slum and the, 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 um, the, uh, the marginalization of the labor, the marginalization of the most vulnerable, it's very, um, we could see it in the example of chapter six um, that Asume just talked about, but also our ch chapter nine about the slum in Burj in India. Um, so, you know, cities are also, or, I mean, we don't deny cities are also the result of this idea of success and modernity. In fact, they're becoming the symbol of modernity and they became also new places for mass consumption and also what Ulrich Brandt uh, mentioned as the, the imperial mode of living. So, um, so therefore, you know, the cities are being built in this very complex dialectic between individual aspiration and access and alternative model for collective needs. Um, all our case studies in this book, um, their radical practices share one political outlook uh, that is very, very strong. It's this notion of dignity of territory and sovereignty and self-determination. We don't choose to dwell too much in the definition because I think it's important as a global working group with people from different perspectives that we represent this ecology of knowledges. So the one thing that I wanted to say is, uh, of course, you know, in Eurocentric um, notion of dignity, we will think about uh, the father figure, um, you know, uh, making sure that the, the needs of the family is fulfilled. Whereas uh, for in different kinds, in different places, this is more like a question of power, of self-determination. Dignity does not have that Eurocentric kind of definition. It's not about ethics. It's more political. And, uh, you know, that's not the point of the book to define, but I, I, I would say dignity is more close to what Norman Ajari uh, talks about in his book, Dignity or Death, which is an excellent book I recommend also. 
Um, so the other thing that is very central to this um, to this radical practice are communities. The one thing that we realize is without communities, they, they can't be radical political power. It's it's almost impossible. And this throughout the book we can see it. Uh, most importantly, I think chapter three about Brazil, um, it's, it's quite clear that uh, the one, uh, the way they create power was to, to, to rebuild the community. So they actually stop in this chapter, it's very interesting, they stop kind of claiming for their rights. They decided it's, it's, no, it's not useful to just ask for the rights to the city, but it's important to build the community and just exercise their right without any, without claiming it. So building the community has been an essential, essential step for transformation in Brazil and in other, in other context too. Um, the other point I want to mention in a lot of communitarian practices as root, are rooted in the past. This is so obvious in uh, chapter five about the US where a lot of these, um, a lot of the cooperatives, for example, work is rooted uh, into, you know, in African uh, pra cultural practice um, before people were enslaved and then they were, you know, communicated through generation to generation. So it's, it's really rural, it's, it's, it's rooted in the past. Uh, same thing for San Roque Market in chapter four. Um, another crucial point is that uh, communities, different communities can transfer knowledge. And this is what I think chapter eight, uh, the, the chapter about Syria is, is very interesting because um, th there is a change of relationship. It became the rural area were helping the besieged cities by sharing seeds with them, by telling them how to grow the seeds, by doing uh, radio programs. And so they were sharing knowledge about how to, how to reach food sovereignty. And I think that that solidarity between communities has been a key element throughout the book, even what Asumi just said, between solidarity between Makoko and Morocco was very important for uh, the resistance of the Makoko slum. Another point is, you know, it's not with the state or without the state um, that we realize, you know, you, we can't, we could decide to change the state, but the state is um, shaped by the way we produce things um, and the economy shapes the state. So it's not, the question here is, it's not all the time, it's not automa automatic that the state is something we have to oppose. But what we've learned is by changing the practice of how we do so, uh, how we reproduce, how we do the economy, how we build these new uh, social relationships, that has tendency, has more power to change the state. This happens in the chapter about Ecuador. Um, the other point I wanted to mention was uh, this idea of political power. Uh, a lot of communities, like I said, don't wait to be given power, but just simply exercise by building the, the uh, communities. These were the important points, kind of what, what we identify. Now, I wanted to talk about strategy. I don't have much time, but, I, but the goal is not to give you all the strategies because I'd like you to read the book. <laughs> so I'm just going to go and very, very quickly say a couple of ones. Um, what we, we've noticed, there's an importance of intergenerational response in each transformation. What we what we find is that there is not um, the transformation, the, the most successful, include different generations. And it goes beyond sometimes uh, ways it could that are material, because, for example, in the United States, the black community is using like Afrofuturism, which is a way to commonize an imaginary like uh, how would we see ourselves as a community in the future and that is very powerful because they bring it together multiple generation and when i was there with elandria williams in detroit we were invited to an amazing talk about you know a discussion with many many generation children and seniors and all different people and they all come, came together to 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 discuss whether Detroit could be the uh, Wakanda uh, from the Black Panther uh, movie, which which is a way to a way to make sure that you don't let white people control your narrative and you know where you're going, and this is absolutely powerful. Um, 
the other uh, the other important thing is that um, we realize that so basically you know creating a space where multiple generation can gather and communicate not only in time and protest but in order to talk strategy so but embracing an intergenerational approach doesn't entail adopting a defeatist attitude in the present you know <clears throat> defending the commons and resisting violence and immediate is an immediate priority that cannot be compromised um, similarly, in a broader struggle, particularly in, reach, in relation to coloniality, imperialism, land and dignity have consequences for different generations, and that must not be jeopardized. Even in the short-term gain would benefit the movement in question. Movements pressing for radical transformation and the left in general need to be clear and to oppose occupations, colonization, and to continue resisting and defeating imperialism. For us, this is an absolute, it's central because these are the fights that impacts many generations. So we can't compromise on this. The other, other uh, strategies that I wanted to talk is about building new subjectivities. This is uh, particularly in, um, important because, you know, unless we rest control over the material condition for restoring dignity, democratizing economies and contesting the tyranny of private property through cooperativism and communitarian economic practice, urban radical transformation will not be viable. And the political action based on interpretation of what dignity and living well mean in urban space must serve to destabilize the notion of poverty, progress and individualism and sustain of the imperial mode of living by building emancipatory vision that includes commoning and democratization of contemporary cities. So, you know, one of the things that we, as a group, when we were in Barcelona, we met, we met with um, Barcelona and Comu, and we also met people from La Hydra Cooperativa, sorry. And they were saying something is super interesting is in 2011 when there was this whole um, movement against uh, uh, the dispossession uh, of people when they had to pay the debt and they were kicked out of the apartment. Um, the whole movement at first, you know, they, they were just 30 people. They realized they didn't do a good job. Um, so they decided to completely, you know, to to inform people and to to explain and you're not if you can't pay your rent it's not your fault the the problem is much bigger it's this capitalist system that has uh you know commodify everything and then you have these funds from the the city of london buying these apartment and the speculation so they're trying to to shift the subjectivities and and so they wrote a many little like uh, little books they've distributed they did a huge effort and you know after two years only these 30 people that first showed up became million of indignados so the importance of building subjectivities and and reclaiming the narrative is uh is very very important um i don't know if i have a little more time i don't have the time um i would just say uh to, to finish is there is many strategies in this book. I won't go over them all. Um, this is um, a book for you. It's going to be free download this week. This week. Um, there's a lot of information in there that can be helpful for you. Um, and we can't wait to hear about your feedback on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mavruka. I'll just quickly share with our audience the cover of your lovely book that they can see it as well. And yeah, especially also to your authors and us to meet all of you, thank you very much. And I'm looking to hear even more about you or about your book in the discussion. So now um, we can turn to our second book of today. Um, which is the book towards a political economy of degrowth. Uh, we can show to you the cover of that as well. One second. So this book uh, 
from this book, we have the authors Stefan, Stefania Barsa, Emanuele Leonardi, and Max Koch with us. And Stefania Barsa is a senior researcher at the Center for Social, Social Studies um, of the University of Coimbra, which teaches political ecology and coordinates the Oficina de Ecología y Sociedad. And she's also a member of the Coalition Council of the Green New Deal for Europe. Max Koch is a sociologist and professor of social policy at the Duke University of Sweden. And Emanuele Leonardi works as the researcher of the, at the University of Parma. And amongst his interests are the intersection between degrowth and historical materialism, climate justice, and labor environmentalism. And now I would like to hand over to Stefania. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone for being here and many thanks for uh, the uh, presentation of the uh, Dignity book. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I really look forward to downloading and reading it. It's, uh, I think this, we, need, we definitely need more of this kind of book. So the book I am going to talk about is, um, is not uh, so um, strategy oriented as as or, or movement oriented. It's much more um, a book about uh, the way we do political economy, the way we think political economy, because we thought this would be, uh, this is a way in which the obsession with growth is reproduced through the academic system, through the educational system and in public discourse and in the media and in the, in the, uh, in the common sense. So, but first, before I'm entering into the topic, let me tell you a little bit of information on the context uh, where this book comes from. It's um, the result of a collective work that uh, we conducted as uh, members of uh, a uh, research group uh, on uh, degrowth, uh, and this was um, uh, the group was based at Lund University in Sweden. Uh, the project was led by Alex Paulson and uh, and Ekaterina Cherkotskaya, who are the other two co-editors of this book. Um, and uh, uh, the project ran for uh, almost one year back in 2015 and uh, 2016. Uh, and all the chapters you find in the book are either from people who were members of that group or people who contributed to our um, project by participating in our uh, monthly seminars or uh, our, our final workshop. Um, so I will go to, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the book's uh, general content and then, then I will give the floor to uh, two of the others uh, who are uh, here with us, Max and Emanuele. Uh, so our starting point, the starting point for, for this book was, uh, uh, is a critique of political economy as a discipline and as a public discourse that is disseminated through the media and that shapes the public's attitudes towards the economy and it forms the, the hegemonic common sense about the economy. Uh, we call this common sense gross realism. This is a concept that we uh, re-elaborate from uh, uh, Mark Fisher, who famously spoke about capitalist realism um, based on the now very uh, popular quote uh, from Frederick Jameson uh, uh, that it is still easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Um, and, and Mark Fisher, uh, starting from that, he uh, uh, elaborates on why capitalism has become, in, 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 in common sense, the only possible uh, world. And we take from that, we apply that idea to idea to the concept of, uh, of growth, of GDP growth. So we, we say it is actually still easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of GDP growth, because even um, international and national politics of uh, climate politics are actually uh, geared towards growth, towards what, uh, what the United Nations call 
green growth and have adopted green growth has the, the most uh, um, important um, paradigm to address climate change. So it is truly impossible to imagine the end of growth. Um, and so the way we understand um, this, this hegemonic common sense um, is that, it, how does it work? Um, like, like in the case of capitalist realism, so in the case of growth realism, um, the point is not claiming that growth is the perfect system, okay? But um, the, the point is to claim that growth is the only system compatible with human nature and with the, the, the laws of, of uh, economic laws, the laws of, of, uh, of economics. So there is a process of naturalization of growth that goes on in the political economy as a discipline and as a discourse and as a public discourse. Uh, and so growth, it, it becomes not a choice, not a political choice, it's, it's depoliticized. It becomes a natural mechanism that obeys mechanical laws, the laws of, uh, of the economy. And its self-proclaimed virtue consists in, in protecting us, the people, from the illusion of unrealistic alternatives. That's, that's why growth realism, that's what we mean by growth realism. That's why it is so powerful, because the discourse uh, uh, tends to protect uh, us from, uh, from unrealistic alternatives. And of course, the most powerful critique towards degrowth it's exactly this, that Negroes is non-realistic, no? or at least one of the most powerful critiques. But since we are all, we, we all share the understanding that Negroes is in fact the only realistic hypothesis to avoid climate and ecological breakdown, then the question becomes one of reframing Negroes as a realistic alternative. So this is what our book aims primarily to contribute to by uh, disentangling political economy from growth. So this is how this is what we aim to do and offer tools to develop a political economy that is not a political economy of growth, but it's a political economy of degrowth. How do we do that? Uh, the book is divided in three sections. Uh, the first one problematizes the discourse of the economy and 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 shows how political economy uh, is um, uh, is it's been depoliticized, but it's actually deeply political. So uh, and uh, and the section does this by showing the diversity of political economy. There is not one political economy. There are many. And there are different tools within the tradition of thought of political economy that are actually much more consistent with the degrowth than with growth. Uh, for example, um, uh, the, the first chapter by Alex Paulson talks about system theory as a, as a, uh, a body of thought that uh, is uh, that originated the concept of, uh, of GDP growth, but at the same time within itself it contained also the antidote to growth itself. And that antidote has, has been lost somehow in the, in the, in the following uh, decades. Or for example, uh, the, the second chapter talks about comparative political economy as a particular uh, kind of approach of political economy that allows to criticize uh, the hegemony of growth. Um, then we have the two chapters from Leonardi and then Koch uh, that uh, talk about how uh, Marx uh, himself and different and some currents of Marxist thought, like in Andre Gore, also offer a number of uh, conceptual tools uh, that are entirely consistent with degrowth rather than growth. Um, and finally, in this section uh, about political economy as a, as a thought. A uh, body of thought. We have a chapter by Gregoratti and Raphael who um, talk about feminist degrowth, and and they show how there are uh, the degrowth thought is uh, um, um, deeply entrenched into the especially especially ecofeminist um, tradition since the 80s. 
Um, then we have a second section that introduces a deeper perspective uh, on, uh, on the effects of, of growth and growth realism in some of the fastest growing economies of the last decade. Uh, Brazil, Turkey, South Africa, China, and Russia. Uh, so why, why this section? I, we thought it was important to kind of um, um, enroute a, a, a critique of growth from a different con context that are not the, the well, first of all, to, to enroot it in, 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 in particular context, no? so not speaking, not universalizing the European experience as if it were representative of the entire world. We actually, um, one of our um, basic points is that um, the growth is not, it is a non-universal, but it's a situated concept that emerges from and reflects the historical experience of the so-called first world, starting from Europe. But at the same time, we wanted to call attention towards the, the fact that um, uh, GDP growth and the growing uh, and the rich countries do not coincide with Europe or, or not even with the uh, um, United States uh, or, or Australia, or the countries that we use normally associate with uh, um, with the, the uh, as rich countries, but now uh, there are a number of countries who are actually which are um, take, are taking up much of the world's GDP growth, in, and, and and I have done that for uh, for the at least the past decade. So it is important to look at what's happening, how growth, economic growth, looks like in those contexts, and how. Uh, degrowth would look like in those contexts. So this is the, the aim of this section of the book. Uh, this opens with uh, a chapter on uh, on Russia and the former you know, Soviet Union by uh, by Etatia Tsiolkovskaya uh, that shows how growth realism and uh, and degrowth thought are, are not a prerogative of the capitalist world but actually uh, belonged to the Soviet world as well. Um, and both, both the, um, the imperative of growth, the hegemony of growth, and the exist existence of uh, um, alternative conceptual tools, alternative thoughts uh, that were as deeply enrooted in, uh, in, Russian, in, in the Russian tradition back to the 19th century. Uh, then there is a chapter on Brazil uh, by Felipe Melanes uh, that shows the, 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 the colonial and racist and patriarchal dimensions of growth in, in Brazil, uh, focusing specifically on, on uh, Amazonia and, uh, and also the, the re-existence, so the, the resistance, but also the, the, uh, uh, the alternative forms of existence uh, that people uh, put in practice in the Amazon region and that are deeply inspiring for uh, the growth everywhere. <clears throat> uh, then there is a chapter by Patrick Bond that compares China and South Africa's um, growth over the past decade as an illuminate, illuminating example of uh, devaluation of what, what Bond defines as the devaluation of overaccumulated capital as a, as a mechanism, as a key mechanism to understand uh, economic growth, the process of economic growth, and it's, and especially its uneven um, character, no? uneven development. Um, then we have a chapter on Turkey from Mine Islar and, uh, Islar and uh, Bulz Bandilar that describes the contradictions of uh, urban uh, growth and specifically the urban green growth, um, the, the politics of, of sustainable development in the city, uh, and and its contradictions um, in um, uh, the internal contradictions and uh, and also contradictions in the relationship between city and and country. Um, then we have a third section that closes the book with a discussion of uh, some key concepts in uh, concepts that we 
um, identified as crucial to a political economy of degrowth. And these are contested concepts. Uh, uh, work, money, self-sufficiency, and well-being, and the state. So uh, we have, uh, the, this section have, who opens with uh, a chapter by myself on work, of which I will tell you more uh, later. Then we have a chapter from uh, on Hornburg about money that that um, in uh, in uh, in one point uh, makes the point of replacing general purpose money with two separate spheres of exchange, so two different uh, currencies, two different kinds of, uh, of two different monetary uh, means, uh, one uh, local and community based, and one global. Um, so this is his proposal to how to rethink money in a degrowth, uh, in a political economy of degrowth. Then we have a chapter uh, from Corostisa uh, about self-sufficiency that problematizes this concept of self-sufficiency that is also one central concept to degrowth, but it, it problematizes it as uh, it, by showing how this concept has been also co-opted and used by the far right in uh, uh, both uh, currently and historically by fascist regimes um, because of its uh, um, some characteristics of some some features uh, some particular ways of understanding self-sufficiency that are masculinist and, and racist. Um, and so he discusses, the chapter discusses on how we can uh, rethink self-sufficiency in a way that is more emancipatory and liberatory. Uh, then we have a chapter on well-being, also a key uh, concern for, uh, for the growth that um, uh, from Helne and uh, Hildi Langmi uh, that uh, um, um, talks about uh, how well-being shall, shall be um, um, understood as both material and immaterial. So by uh, as, as something that um, is uh, premised on the satisfaction of material needs as a basis for then the development of immaterial um, um, aspects of the human uh, of human realization, the the doing, the loving, and the being. Um, but all this immaterial part uh, can uh, can only be premised on a material uh, on the satisfaction of material needs of of, uh, of humans. And then we have uh, the last chapter, last but not least, uh, from Giacomo D'Alisa is about the state. The state as a, um, in a deep growth perspective and how to transform the state itself uh, uh, through a Gramscian approach. Uh, uh, that is the takes of uh, the, the concept of integral state from Gramsci to make the point that the growth cannot be, uh, cannot ignore the, the topic, the, the, the challenge of changing the state um, if it wants to be uh, a realistic alternative because the state is not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, so it's better to change it, to transform it. So, um, and I conclude here just saying that overall, um, the, the aim of the book is that of um, um, allowing for um, formulating uh, political demands that reflect the experience and uh, and convergence of different social uh, subjects in different in different contexts. And so, um, so we make a point that uh, one of the major strengths of degrowth as a body of thought and as a movement is its diversity. So the and this is of course also a challenge: how to maintain this diversity and heterogeneity. Um, by I, at, the, at the same time uh, keeping uh, uh, keeping the movement focused and uh, and and uh, and realist. So um, there is a tension, of course, here between the language of political economy and and that of utopianism of of uh, yeah nomad nomadism. No, we what we call 
nomadic utopianism uh, it, it, um, it's actually the, the part of the response that we suggest uh, by which we mean embodying the experience of, of both ghosts and the ghosts in different contexts to um, uh, to formulate a common language of all the people who are oppressed by gross realism, all, all those who find gross realism uh, an impossible and unsustainable reality and are, have a vested interest in, uh, in replacing it with a different kind of reality. And I'll stop here and um, we'll um, give the floor now to uh, Max Koch to briefly introduce and 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 Emanuele Leonardi soon after him to briefly introduce their chapters. Um, yes, please. Yeah, right. Many thanks for having me. It's uh, good to see you again, Lele, Stefania, and to meet the others from the also very interesting book. And, and I want to to uh, congratulate the organizers for. Uh, fantastic conference it, 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 it's been great to, to, to be here um, on, on on Friday I, I I said that one of the of the major minds of the 19th, 20th century Pierre Bourdieu has has got a lot to um, contribute to to deep growth reasoning particularly to the uh, pre preconditions for um, Growth transition, and I, I would even now go further to say that um, uh, Marx, uh, 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 a major mind of the 19th century, can also uh, be read with a with with a wind for 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 degrowth theorizing, in particular when it comes to a political economy of of degrowth. So I, I'll keep this very short. I, I make two points in the. The chapter, which is called "Growth and Degrowth in Marx: Critique of Political Economy." In in, in general, Marx proceeds by always, as you know, from the rising from the abstract to the concrete, by always looking at um, economic categories, social relations, and modes of consciousness at the same time. And um, the first point I, I make here is is that. Um, actually, Marx has a has a kind of useful theory um, about how the growth imperative is actually inscribed in the basic social structures of the capitalist universe. Um, I'm not going in the detail about that, but it is uh, associated with this discussion of the production of relative surplus value, which. Um, um, well, uh, it, it refers to competition where, 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 where um, uh, individual um, entrepreneurs tend to, to, to seek a, a competition advantage against uh, the others. And they often do so by uh, raising productivity, which is often uh, through replacement of, well, uh, living work by uh, machinery. But at, at least if you if you follow the the value theory of of labor for for a second, then uh, you see that at this that 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 has a, a contradiction in that it basically excludes the value source of 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 um, the economy from the from the a company, and so that the only way to to compensate for that is is to expand the overall scale of production, so that. Uh, the growth imperative in, in the sense of always um, expanding production and consumption patterns is, is from the beginning actually present in, in Marx's argument in, in capital. And the, the second point I make refers to what Stefania said earlier. Um, he, as I said, um, he, he doesn't look only at, at economic categories which he develops from commodity, money, capital, etc. But he also looks at the ways that the economic agents basically perceive that. And there you have this um, distortion from um, particular um, social and, his and, and historical categories into natural ways of being, which you, which you can also find here, beginning, beginning from, the, from the wage form where every um, a difference between um, 
um, necessary work and surplus work is, is abolished and, and after which basically profit and, and work has to follow other, other sources. And in the end, when he, when he arrives at the, the, um, the, the trinitary form in the, in the third volume of Capital, um, then the, the total distortion of a very specific economic arrangement is complete so that, as I said, all the people involved there, they feel like fishes in the water and, and perceive this particular economic arrangement as the way uh, that the, the economy as such, basically, and as the natural way to do things. And um, I, I would argue this is one of the major uh, preconditions, of the major obstacles, basically, to, to, um, to, um, to question the growth imperative and to, and, and to get over it. Um, so um, I would argue, and this is where I already uh, stopped for an um, um, for a dialogue between the kind of the the, the more um, 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 the more um, positive and, and and academic Marxian tradition with uh, with 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 degrowth uh, basically and and common benefit. Yeah, this is not to deny that a, a, a range of Marxists have. Um, have uh, a kind of um, um, a celebrated the growth imperative um, and 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 wanted to to even outcompete uh, capitalism, but I don't think, and this is one of the points in the chapter, that this is actually an issue of Marx himself. Thanks very much. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, um, Lele is of course next in in turn. I was. The floor is yours. Okay, Manuele just left our conversation here. Um, maybe, well, if he doesn't come back in a second, maybe Stefania or Max, you can talk a little bit more about um, about his chapter. You have to turn on your microphone, though. Uh, but I see Emmanuel yeah. is coming back. So yeah, there he is. So okay. please, the, the floor uh, is I yours. I hope my connection uh, keeps working because I couldn't hear very well uh, Max and then I was uh, I found myself outside of the room so I hope it works can you hear me properly yeah okay so let's uh, try first of all thanks a lot Lena for uh, moderating this and all to the all the, uh, the organizers for uh, putting together such a great conference I really enjoyed it and uh, as Yorgos I am also very very happy to be um, able to present uh, to talk about our book in connection with a um, series of dignity, because I think there are connections and I, well, all the people uh, who participated, I know, I really uh, like. So just uh, um, a few things about uh, my contribution, which, uh, which is in the same part of the book uh, um, Max's contribution is, uh, is in. And basically what I want to say is that when uh, uh, Stefania, uh, Katia, Chetkoskaya uh, and Alex Paulson invited me to the um, today's seminars about these issues uh, what i wanted to do my goal was basically to support uh, a development within the degrowth community which i had seen uh, uh, occurring in the previous uh, uh, international conference of the degrowth community itself uh, it was the fourth in uh, in leipzig and so um, uh, um, reducing throughput, so the so-called less. Could you repeat? Could you repeat the last sentence? Your video was frozen, and but now you're back, I think. Okay, so I'll, well, I'll restart from where I left, hoping uh, the others uh, had understood. Uh, I've understood. If not, uh, well, I don't know what to do. But so basically, the uh, the shift. Uh, I, I saw was from a, a, a focus on uh, uh, reducing throughput, so the so-called less aspect of the growth uh, analysis, to a focus on uh, radically transforming 
uh, the economy and society, the so-called uh, different aspect, uh, and by different uh, meaning uh, uh, emancipatory. And I wanted to support that because uh, I saw them um, opening up a space for dialogue between degrowth and, and uh, eco-socialism. Uh, and I thought that space was worth um, cultivating. And since Andre Gorz uh, is supposed to be, is considered to be a precursor, a precursor of both streams of thought, uh, I thought it was um, a very viable starting point to um, reflect on such um, issues. Uh, well, who was Andre Gorz for those who are not familiar with uh, uh, him? Uh, he was a very well known uh, public figure in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. We can't hear you again, Emanuele. Maybe you could turn off your video, so uh, that might help that we can understand you better. Otherwise, um, one of the others could maybe finish for you. Okay, it seems he's frozen, so maybe Stefania, you could turn on your microphone and just um, say some finishing sentences for your book. Yeah, I I didn't understand you, Lena. I'm Should I go on? No. Okay, we can hear you again. So you can uh, say some yes, some last sentences. Please go ahead. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Uh, I, I don't really know what to do. Maybe when we they, tested the the question was okay. Because. I think Sorry, Stefania, you can you turn off your video. Um, that might make the, make the connection better. Lele, maybe you could take off your video. Okay, I will. Can you hear me a little better? Yes, it's very good now. Thanks. Okay, let's. Uh, well, I mean, I'll, I'll take uh, just uh, two minutes to finish. Um, yes. and then I'll, uh, I'll stop. So the, the two elements I wanted to uh, focus on in my uh, contribution uh, were um, first uh, the fact that uh, in Gorty's account uh, uh, ecological issues are always thought together with labor uh, transformation and that of course uh, uh, was uh, conducive to thinking the growth and eco-socialism together and also second point uh, is very original interpretation of the oil shock of 1973 and this, he basically says this crisis is the first in which we have a common Marxist uh, uh, trade, like you know the crisis of other production but also just beside that this is also a crisis of reproduction because the conditions of production themselves are uh, put to risk through environmental uh, damage and in that sense Gors uh, anticipated uh, um, James O'Connor's uh, famous second contradiction uh, thesis. I conclude by saying that well beyond uh, the elements, the aspects I discuss uh, in, uh, in my chapter, I think that the space for dialogue between degrowth and eco-socialism uh, has been growing in these uh, last uh, years and I have seen happening uh, in many sessions at this conference, so uh, this is one of the reasons why I enjoyed so much these um, conferences. And uh, two uh, aspects which are not at all treated in, uh, in the chapter, but which may be of interest uh, if we want to start from God's to uh, uh, strengthen the connection between the growth and eco-socialism, um, that I want to list the two. Uh, movement because they pose uh, the issue of relocalizing the economy in close connection with uh, an opportunity to renew uh, democracy and in that sense I would say uh, Santiago Gorostiz's contribution in the book about uh, how to think like how can we possibly use 
Autarky is in close connection. And uh, um, also, the, the last point is in the last issue of Le Monde Diplomatique, uh, Cédric Duran uh, and Razmik Kilcheyan have laid out um, very uh, specific proposals for uh, ecological uh, planning. And again, goals can be useful because uh, through his writings, we uh, know, I would say, that we need to think uh, the struggle for equality within a situation, uh, an economic situation in which throughput is going to be uh, reduced. So these two uh, imperatives are now, uh, like, I would say, um, at the forefront of ecological struggles. And so it may be useful to go back to God's to find uh, new inspiration. Thank you so much. And I am sorry um, about the connection uh, problems. Thank you very much. Um, sadly, we really don't have much time for a discussion now, but um, I'm pretty sure that some of you will join the Discord discussion afterwards. Um, but let me just pose one very quick question to Anna Sofania, left the discussion. Um, well, then let me pose a question that came up in the, uh, in the discussion to Mabruka. Uh, in how far the, um, your ideas or what you talk about relates to the current situation in the USA, um, especially in connection with the, with the death now of, um, of George Floyd. So maybe you could um, touch upon that in a minute or two. Right. Yeah, yeah. of course it needs more time, but very quickly, I just wanted to repeat that uh, the murder of jo George Floyd is not an incident. It is really symptomatic of white supremacy in the United States. It's important for everyone to understand that within the United States, the black community, indigenous people, brown people, they live under a colonial settler racist state. And they're being um, treated as disposable labor that you can lock up and jail and kill. This is what is being uh, resisted right now. People are taking the street. But what, I, what our book is also explaining, it's giving the full picture of this resistance that didn't start just now. It's deeply rooted during the, the, the slavery and um, the whole cooperative movement, uh, the whole uh, movement to, to create new economies uh, built on mutual aid. This started a long, long time ago and has shaped alternatives that we can see that you can discover in the book in Birmingham in Detroit, in Detroit, Birmingham, and Jackson. So uh, what has happened? So just wanted to say that for most of the world, people who view the United States and the struggle by the black community, they think the struggle started and ended with the civil rights movement. But in fact, it's been uh, decades, centuries in the making, this resistance. And what we're seeing right now is just one element of it. And yeah, so. So read the book to have a better, it, it has a whole historical uh, chapter on, on this whole struggle. Okay, thank you very much, Mabuka. Um, I'd love to discuss more with all of you and also answer some questions for, um, for your, the other book, um, Towards the Political Economy of the Group. But sadly, we really have only two minutes left. Um, so I would like to invite all of you to come to the Discord channel, which you will see in a second, where you can join us and ask your questions to some of the presenters there. Um, so thank you very much for all of you to be here with me today. It was really a pleasure, pleasure listening to your great work, and I'm definitely interested in reading those books now. Um, so I'd like to tell our audience also where to find them, even though you touched upon it as well during the discussion. But um, towards the political economy of degrowth, you will or you can find on romaninternational.com. And the book Cities of Dignity, um, you can find on the website beyonddevelopment.net for free download. So um, yeah, and on that website, you can also find some more infos about the current work of, um, of this topic and also different aspects aspect of um, degrowth and how it relates to the current pandemic now. So thank you to all of you and to our audience. You can see hopefully now 
a link that redirects you to Discord. And I'm happy to hear back from you um, and to hear more about your interesting work. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.